Max Verstappen, you've been accused of being too aggressive and of lacking respect. How do you respond to this? And stop bothering me, old man. Fair enough. Hello and welcome back to Gareth Jones on Speed after an extended summer break, which some of us have not yet returned from. And so the part of Zog for this programme will be played by Alex Goy. Man, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. And the good thing is the line between me and Zog is blurring slowly because we look the same. So I could very well just be Zog. If you're listening in black and white... You probably won't be able to tell the difference. It's only if you're listening in colour will you actually know that this is not Zog. Alex, welcome back, yes. man. Good that, to see you. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Always an honour. And briefly here, before jetting away to other parts of the world, Richard Porter. Hey, Rich. Hello. Call you Rich, baby, can I? I've never called you Rich before, no. have I? Ever. Very yeah. few people call me Rich. Without getting punched. There's no punching. I mean, if you no. call me Dick. The maybe <laughs> a, wh- a whisper of threatening behaviour. Anyway, we are back, and so is Formula One. Hooray! I thought, because there are so many races this year, that I would start to care a bit less about Formula One. You share the love over a greater number of races. And yet, the final few days in the build-up to Spa, I couldn't get started quick enough. Well, you couldn't get started quick enough, I just couldn't get started. <laughs> I'm... I was aware there was a race going on because you get all the people on the Twitter and the Facebook going, oh yep. my God, Spa if one's back. And yep. I was just like, oh good, so Mercedes is going to win. Correct. Lovely. Yep. And they did. Yeah. And Lewis Hamilton had a million grid place penalties. Yeah. And I'm assuming he's starting on Wednesday. Yeah, in though, Germany somewhere. In, in Germany yeah. somewhere. Though actually, I heard about what he did and yeah. he's a really good driver. Isn't yeah, he? correct. Yeah, you were there to see it, Richard. Porter, weren't you? Well, yeah, that's why I could very much get excited about the Belgian Grand Prix, knowing that I was going to it, Ooh. which is always nice. And I'd had that sort of in the diary for a long time. It was on a complete blag with Mercedes, and it was excellent. Did I'd you pay mean, the price for it now. <laughs> did you meet Nico? Yes. And how did you get on with Nico? Well... Did you throw a hat at him? <laughs> I, I wish I'd thought of that. So Nico, sign this. <laughs> Number two, on it. we had as Ooh. guests of Mercedes Benz, we had a brief audience with Hamilton on Saturday after qualifying Saturday evening at their fancy motorhome hospitality place mm-hmm. up on the roof where they have a terrace. I know it's mental, and then you remember that it's actually a couple of lorry trailers and it all folds out from that, but you forget it feels like a real building, those things are extraordinary. Mm. And so, we're up on the roof, beautiful weather. The name drop police are coming for me. (laughs) And this is just the start, officers. Go on. I'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, so Hamilton came up. Now, I've been in a room where he's been before. He doesn't enjoy that side of it. You just can tell. And he politely goes through the motions, but you can sense that his heart's not really in it. There's a clang coming up in a minute. So on our trip... I'm primed. ...were not only just a few journo scum like me, but also a smattering of celebrities, including the urban musician Professor Green. Clang. Who is... A real professor? He's not. Uh. We were saying <laughs> we were saying this not to his face, because his real name is Stephen, and you refer to him as Stephen, because it's weird, weird. And I had to stop myself from going, um, Prof, do you want to do another thing? Because <clears throat> he's not a real professor. But I was saying with a colleague of mine who was there that perhaps he is a professor... But he's got a residency at uh, like an urban teaching hospital. But then he's going to go into the consultancy and he'll go back to just being Mr. Green. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you know, what happens. I was, yes. I was Dr. Green and yeah. I got this professorship. Uh, yeah. But then, yeah, eventually I'll just, I'll, I'll do. No, he's not. He's a really, really nice bloke. But he, as we're sort of all crowded around Hamilton and he's kind of going, yeah, you know, yeah, I do like Spa. It's a nice track. And sort of, it's just because, you know, he's said all these things before. I didn't ask him any questions. All I can think of are either boring questions, which will have been asked before, about F1 or really silly questions, yeah. and that might just sour the whole thing if he doesn't quite get it and he'll walk off. So yeah. I kept quiet, but uh, Emeritus Professor of Fat beats. beats, Professor Green, asked him about his music, and he sort of lit up a little bit. I mean, he still didn't exactly kind of effuse, but he was engaged more with that, because at least people weren't asking him about tyre choices and things was, like that. Was it along the lines of, so, Lewis, when are you going to release your potentially quite average hip-hop? <laughs> well, here's the thing. You see, the Professor has met him before, not Alan Prost, the other one. Yeah. So, and said Hamilton played him some tracks. Right. This was later on in the evening. We went, whoa, hang on a minute, what were they like? And he went, they were really good. 
He's oh. been working with some brilliant producers. He's singing on them. Yeah. He's, he's not rapping or anything on the ones that the prof heard. Yeah. But he said, yeah, that it's good. Honestly, he was really quite impressed. He, I heard him singing in a club. Well, I wasn't there, but there is a clip of him singing in a club. And fair play, he's got a decent voice and he can actually play the piano. I've seen yeah. him play the piano. Yeah, yeah. On, on his Instagram. <laughs> yes. Uh, his Instagram with his dog sat next to it and yeah. dribbling and farting and whatever dogs do. Really Instagram like world dog. champion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lewis Hamilton. Well, he revealed some of his music in an interview on 60 Minutes in the States to Mr. Charlie they did, Rose. Didn't they? And they played little bits of it. They played little yeah. clips of it. And I am musically illiterate, as you know. <laughs> But it sounded like noise that was almost pleasant. Yeah, well, well it wasn't. You didn't go. Oh, oh dear. No. Well, That's Jack thing, Villeneuve has set a standard. Hasn't I he? saw Jack Villeneuve at a distance across the paddock. Hello, clang. Yeah, and I, I almost <laughs> went. Oh no, it's Jack effing Villeneuve. And then uh, mm-hmm. I, I thought, no, don't. Want he does French TV, doesn't he? So he was there with a the crew doing stuff. But didn't um, have acoustic guitar with him and knocked no, out the album. No, I would have. I, th- I think they put snipers on the top of those motorhomes to ensure that Jack Villeneuve is not allowed to pick up a guitar. Because you know it's his fault Shoot that to we... kill the guitar <laughs> and him. It's Jack Villeneuve's fault that we do songs on Gareth Jones on Speed because when he released that album, I can't remember what the song was called. I think, and I heard it. I thought, God, that's so simple. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the very first songs we wrote for Gareth Jones on Speed as a parody was a song in the style of Jack Villeneuve. It's his fault. It's always his fault. It's Can't wait for the Lewis everything. album. Everything. Can't his fault. wait. For well, the so album. the prof asked him, "Where are you going to release any of it?" And he went, "No, not at the moment. No, just concentrating on the thing." He went, "If I had more time, I would devote it to the music, and I'd do it when I can. But it's basically a hobby at the moment because I've got to concentrate on this." He actually said, "He said if we didn't have a championship-winning car, I'd have more time. But the thing is, once you've got the car, you can't let the team and the car down by sort of taking your eye off the ball. It's actually." more time consuming to be as dominant as Mercedes are he is was... he basically saying I'm sorry I'm too busy being brilliant well that's the thing <laughs> but then we were talking about this because then so Professor Green said the music it was good he wouldn't be laughed out of town for it except that particularly in this country you're not allowed to be brilliant at two things correct yeah. No. Yeah. So while he's busy being brilliant as a racing driver, he's not allowed to release what potentially could be actually quite a good album if it's your kind of thing. I don't know. So that was that. Lewis came up, sort of, I, I hesitate to say phoned in a meet and greet, but it was a bit like, you just, you just I felt like sorry for him. He's just like, he's just, you know, he's done this a million times and it's just annoying. It's not yeah. his job. How awful of... for him, though. Oh, no. Yeah. Really? To yeah. have to have a conversation with people to repeatedly. Well, yeah. Of people you repeat winning your 1200th you. World Championship or whatever. So then, because they don't appear together, then Hamilton led away, there's a pause, and then Rosberg <laughs> is wheeled out onto the roof terrace. And... By then, our group, about 15, 18 people, there are a few other sort of guests up there, including friend of the show, Ted Kravitz. Hooray! Hooray. So we then sort of dispersed these different tables, standing tables around the deck, and I was standing with Ted and a couple of the other people off this flag, and Nico was brought up to the end of our table by the PR, and they went, Nico, this is, and we all introduced ourselves. So then we'd already been talking about the values of 80s cars, so we sort of then brought Nico into this chat. You're so socially skilled. Well, we did, but we didn't do it well enough because there was a point at which we started talking about 205 GTIs. <laughs> and I was debating this with the bloke across the table, a guy called Ben, and I realised that F1 star and potential world champion Nico Rosberg is just standing at the end of his table sort of politely listening to two nerdy men going, <laughs> no, because one went at auction for like 30 grand in the States, didn't it? Yeah, it did, I saw that. And no way in for him. No, well, not really. And then, But then he was sort of politely trying to contribute to the conversation, but it was a bit, with, it was all a bit weird. I felt, I felt like it was like we should have released him. But to his credit, he was sort of there going, uh-huh. And then he kind of tried to chip in and went, you know, that's the thing about some of those old cars, you know, they, they feel so different. It's, I actually prefer a lot of them, and he's got a Pagoda SL, as it turns out. And So he was trying to engage in the conversation, but it's almost like we were sort of ignoring him a bit. Oh. And I just thought it was actually... We, it was like the room of awkwardness, really. It was. Think it was it. That's yeah. exactly what someone said. We, we made our own sort of roof terrace of awkwardness. So the PR came over and went, uh, sorry, sorry, guys, Nico, come and meet some other people over here. And we were like, oh, OK, yeah, no, nice to meet you, bye. And then Ted turned to me and went, it's funny, you didn't tell him you were from Sniff Petrol, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was racked with guilt because I'll be honest and I have been in a room I went to a thing when the Goodwood Festival of Speed was on and Nico did a little sort of personal appearance on stage and did a and a and I was there for that and I remember thinking he was good in a room he's great and he's sort of he is more charismatic than he seems on TV where sometimes yeah. I think he can seem quite uncharismatic and it was the same here, and I, but also just for his politeness of not going, because he could have gone, hey, listen, guys, I've got to go and meet some other people, when we started just rattling on, but he didn't. He stuck it out. Oh. And I thought, 
That's okay. He gets more points from me. He was waiting for a way in. You see, the trouble is you were talking about Peugeots. If you'd mentioned (laughs) Mercedes, he would have been allowed to say something. He cannot mention any other brand other than Mercedes. Surely. They'd hang him. And who are all the sponsors like Hugo Boss? So Petronas, um, Tag, Blackberry. Are they still? Yeah, do they even exist? Yeah, yeah they're, they're stopping making the phone with the actual keyboard on it, much to the dismay of many people in yes. Middle America who think they're important. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think a lot of people who send a lot of emails off their phones. Another friend of the show, Johnny Smith, who we all know. Yeah, he was mortified when he realised that Blackberries were basically cack and falling behind, and had to get an iPhone because he says, "I hate typing on a touchscreen." I like it. So there's, there's, there are people out there, but it's really not enough not of them to make BlackBerry a profitable yeah. company. And what profits they have, they're blowing on the sponsorship of their name of their crap stuff put on the side of the championship leading car. Idiot. Do, do you know anyone who owns a BlackBerry? Not Any anymore. No. They used to, I mean, people did, didn't they? People, yeah. Loads of people had them. It's almost like mm. if you had a BlackBerry, it was because you were like really important. It was your work phone. But, you, yeah. you were yeah. important and you, you had many emails to send, and it was very, very, very important that you sent them immediately. So you, you stop in a corner and then start tapping away the little plastic yeah. ticking noise. And you, yeah. I have done my business. Now I will go on with That's my That's how day. Rosberg could have made it look like he didn't care that we were shutting him out of the conversation by just going, yeah, whatever, and started blackberrying. And just, but he's actually just texting the PR going, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> I've given you the nod. Get me out. So get anyway, I just, to sum up, Lewis Hamilton finds the whole PR side of F1 a bit tedious. I already kind of knew that. Just had it confirmed. Nico Rosberg is... Quite polite. In a minute, I'll tell you about when I met Sergio Perez and complained about my home Wi-Fi to him. He gets that a lot. (laughs) Okay, sorry guys, I'm going to have to drag Lewis away from you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, laters, totally. Stay here, guys. Uh, Nico will be out in just a moment. All right, uh, quick, oh, quick, mask off. There's your blonde wig. Oh, uh, wait, uh, change the name on the overalls. Right, uh, ready? Yeah, boy. No, 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 no. The other voice. Oh, God, sorry, darling. Hold on a moment. Let me get in character. Good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, Nico Rosberg. Hi, guys, for sure. Step Petrol! we got a show on speed! We've had a good old gossip update so far of uh, the stuff that you probably didn't see at the Belgian Grand Prix if you were watching the telly, but the stuff that you didn't see as well, Richard, because you were there that we saw on television. Well, you saw on television. I saw, you didn't <laughs> see it. We, yeah. <laughs> we, me and the listener, the, the Gareth Jones on Speed listener. Yeah, the stuff that you may or may not have noticed while you were there, Richard, did you hear the Belgian anthem? Did you notice that? Yes, but I was having more... Foie gras it shoved was, down my throat. I was, I did, I did hear it, but yes, only a distance. What a jolly, 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 happy, happy tune Isn't that it? is! No. It warmed my heart. We actually said the same thing. We were like, yeah. "This is you jaunty." Did. You didn't notice it. Be jaunty. It was jaunty for an anthem. It was a bit of a dance. Well, you've number. got to love like a jaunty anthem because you, you get those countries like things like the Olympics and they play their anthem. You think, well, this is awfully sad. I'm sure there's like a historical reason for mm. it, people slain in battle and yep. country pride. But then you get one that's a bit umpar and a bit exciting. You think. <laughs> You're proud of your country. Yeah. Well done, you. Yes, not a dirge like. Actually, I can you tell you something that, that I did see that you wouldn't have seen on TV oh. is that the band that played the anthem, mm-hmm. they're like a marching band, and they walked the wrong way around the first corner to get to where they were doing the anthem playing. And I oh, saw them do that. Nice and again, it was jaunty. <laughs> marching bands are inherently jaunty, and well, it was just—it was a great thing to see. We're going to be hearing, I predict, that. Uh, Actually, thinking about it, we're probably not. But I was going to suggest that in future we'll be hearing the Belgian anthem a lot more when Stoffel van Dorn gets a drive. But the trouble is, he's still in a Honda-powered McLaren, which isn't going to win any races for at least three seasons. Uh, Hang on, is he racing as a Belgic? He will race as a Belgic. He is Belgian, Stoffel van Dorn. Oh, I thought he was Dutch. No. Here's the thing, I'll tell you something else, and there's another clan coming up, I warn you now. Here he comes, stand by. So... Max Verstappen has had a huge... No, no, you're going too, you're going okay. too early. I'll point at you and it's really... Right. <laughs> Max Verstappen's had a huge impact on the popularity of F1 in the Netherlands because, yep. you know, the boy there, their boy doing good as well. Yep. So a lot of Dutch people came down to Spa to watch the Grand Prix last weekend because there's their boy. So the stand, the grandstand opposite the pits... Orange. Was lo- yeah, loads yeah. of orange T-shirts, loads of Dutch flags, often with Go Max and stuff written on them. But of course, because it's only down the road for people in the Netherlands, they'd all driven down. This was pointed out to me by, I'm pointing now, 
TV's Martin Brundle. Clang! Who, uh, who I, I was, I'm going to do the four. I was, uh, I was chatting to Martin Brundle in the paddock just, uh, just the other day. Um, <laughs> That's because you were there and we weren't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hello. I've met Brundle a few times before and he's a lovely chap. And, Fantastic. And, and bless him, I was waiting for someone else, just hanging around in the paddock and he suddenly walked by and he spotted me and went, oh, and came over and then we had a lovely chat. We were talking for ages about all sorts of stuff and then, he went, there's loads of Dutch people here this year, like loads, and they've all driven down, so the traffic after the race is going to be especially terrible. My advice, get out before the end. But we didn't. We actually waited for the chequered flag and then made our way out, and we actually had no trouble at all. It was actually really quite plain sailing, and I was driving out onto the motorway and getting out of the area, going to my mate I was in the car with. That Martin Brundle, I respect him as a former <laughs> driver and as a pundit and commentator. He is beyond reproach, but when it comes to giving travel advice, he is full of s***. <laughs> what, what he hadn't calculated or worked out there is that all the Dutch, when they come out of Spa, will turn right. And all the Brits yes. will turn left. They go in a different way. But the thing about Max Verstappen is that he doesn't just appeal to the Dutch because he races on a Dutch license. He was actually born in Belgium. Yeah. And his mum's Belgian, I think. I'm not certain. Yes, that. I think so. Yeah. Yes. So you could describe him as a low countries driver. He's appealing to the Dutch mm. and the Belgians. He might unite mm. <laughs> with yeah. people for the it, first it time. It does mean he floods easily. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah anyway i had to get that other clang in there travel and advice from martin brundle that turned out to be erroneous and you enjoyed the race though richard i hope tremendously so wow, yes, yes yeah. what a race what a race five minutes of that race were hilarious it was like watching a montage of ridiculous things happening cars spinning off cars on fire noses coming off with the underside of the car on fire wings at right angles cars spinning on three wheels it was it was beautiful thank heavens F1's back and thank heavens it hasn't let us down it was all stuff minutes. like where you just thought yes this is unprecedented and weird like Raikkonen yeah. coming into the pits and the underside of his car was on fire yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. which uh, we were all sitting there going Wait, Why? what the yeah, yeah. But, uh, and then uh, throughout the race actually there were moments flurries of insane activity mm-hmm. To the point where, you know when Verstappen and Vettel were tussling? Yes, constantly, repeatedly. And that you could tell the TV director, and this is sadly rare in F1, the TV director doesn't know where to cut to next. Mm -hmm. And they kept having to do replays of Vettel and Verstappen overtaking each other, re-overtaking, because they missed it live. So essentially, like you're saying, you kept getting these sudden montages of action from sort of two minutes previous, because... At the time it was happening, something else interesting was also happening. So, and that's so rare in F1 now. It was brilliant. Formula One has actually become exciting. Well, for one weekend for, in Belgium. For one weekend. Spa is always exciting, I think. It always throws up anomalies. It's beautiful for that. Also, I would have the Silverstone team, the team that's now Force India, that used to be Spiker, that used to be Midland, that used to be Jordan. Were they called anything else at any point? I'm not sure. They've always done well at Spa. There's something about the data on the computers <laughs> in that factory at Silverstone which produces a car which goes well at Spa inexplicable but yeah Force India did well I almost got on the podium with both yeah. their cars you know yeah. magic I'd have liked to have seen that in a way just because it feels yeah. like, cause I not quite like Force India they have these yeah, flashes they, of they, brilliance they, and... they've got this kind of lovely nature to them Yeah, yeah. you want them to win amateurs my, I, I have a... <laughs> enthusiastic amateurs I mean that in a nice way believe me I have, I have a couple of friends we used to watch F1 every race we'd go to a pub or go to my place and drink beer and all that and my flatmate was so in love with Force India he managed to pay I think about 75 quid to get an official Force India t-shirt that actually came from god knows where else in the world and he flew it around and he went so I had to pay the customs on it so it's now pretty much doubled in price but he wears it with pride whenever he watches Aww. an F1 race because they're just the huggy underdoggy yeah, love, yeah. love everything team yeah yeah we, well we used to feel that way about Manor but not since Manor left Manor it was like when the Sugar Babes left the Sugar Babes you couldn't love them anymore and the Manor team that's there now isn't the Manor team that was and so any love that you might have had for the traditional underdog at the back now has to go to Force India they will inherit all our love there's another reason why I was rooting for Force India is because I met a chap called Otmar, who is their chief operating officer, American guy, and he was fantastic, really nice bloke. 
he didn't know who I was at all. I said, hi, I'm Richard. And we were chatting for ages all about stuff, road cars and all manner of things. And then, again, friend of the show, Ted Kravitz, wandered over and went, oh, hi, I'm Aaron. He's like, hey, Ted, how are you doing? And then this bloke went, so, Ted, um, I've been told that the guys from Sniff Petrol are here this weekend. No, and you're and standing Ted, there. Ted immediately started giggling and went, um... This chap, just been talking to you for about half an hour, yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah there you go, here he is. Yeah, bless him, this guy shook my hand and he went, oh yeah, we read your stuff for the team. And I was like, oh. So immediately I'm like, oh, I like Force India now because I'm so completely fickle. Um, <laughs> which leads me into, I met Sergio Perez on a Force India note because, again, Mercedes engine connection, yep. Otmar and Checo, as they all call him, mm -hmm. I, know, I don't get it, um, were brought up to the roof terrace one of the other reasons I like this, that the boss man, Otmar, was because he kind of came in officially on duty, like, hey, 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 and then immediately he sort of just went, oh, there's no one around to tell me off. I'll have a beer, please. <laughs> and he sat and he had a couple of beers and that's how we got talking because he was just sitting there having a beer and he was kind of like, I'm off duty now. And oh. so it was great. But Perez, again, we sort of splintered into different groups. So I was standing there with sort of three or four other people and he was wheeled over. And we started talking. It immediately became apparent that I think Sergio Perez seems quite serious and a bit boring on TV. That he has a brilliant sense of mischief and is quite cool. Because then he was moaning about how boring the paddock is now. And this was sort of half six, seven o'clock on Saturday evening. Beautiful evening. And the paddock was really quiet. We were the only people making any noise. And he's like, he's so boring here. You know, I guess I, I, it didn't used to be like this. And then he started telling us about how when he was sponsored by, um, was it Coeva, the tequila people? Yeah. He arranged at one Grand Prix for them to come down with sort of like a tanker of tequila and set up a little store in the paddock. He's like, it was brilliant. Everyone got so drunk. It was hilarious. <laughs> it was like... His, his most notable contribution to his time in Formula 1 is probably that he got the entire paddock absolutely rat-faced on his home country's product. I remember the last time you were at Spa, you had a very short conversation with Daniel Ricky Kikikiado. Yes. Did you this time? No, didn't. I didn't get a chance to, to no. stalk him because no. I, you know, I always liked him. But no, when he was great, when I got introduced to him, and he went, "Oh, you're the guy from Sniff Petrol." I went, "Yeah," and he went, "Yeah." He's still taking the piss out of me, <laughs> and I went, "Um, oh God, no, um, yes." And then he slapped me on the arm. I went, "Nah, you're all right, mate." And, yeah, charming. Lovely, lovely man, man. lovely. Lovely man. And Weber drank champagne out of his shoe. Yes, I know. Blech. But then we were looking at that, we were going, uh, is that it's like an Aussie tradition or something that we're not aware of? I think it is that. Yes. But yeah, anyway, so incredibly fickle, but I can never work out. Perez sometimes has flashes of brilliance and then flashes of sort of really ordinariness, and I can never figure out if he's actually any good. But as a bloke now, I really like him because at one point he was going, you know, the other thing with the paddock, he's like, where are the girls? Where are the girls? Wow. But then he started asking me because, you know, I'm doing the Grand Tour and he started asking me about that and he was going, so when's it on? How can I see it? And I was like, you know, you watch it through a fire stick or an iPad, so obviously you've got your broadband or whatever. And he's like, yeah, you know, no, broadband is cool because, uh, you know, in Mexico we actually have pretty good broadband, you know, now and it's great. And I was like, oh, luckier than me, my internet at home is terrible. It's good in, if you're in the kitchen where the router is, but it doesn't pass through the thick Victorian wall. And someone else in the group went, you know, you can get those little repeater station things. They're, I think they're quite good. And, and Perez is like, oh, yeah, I've heard they're pretty good. Yeah. And then and I was like, yeah, I've tried a few of them. And I'm, they never quite hit the spot. And I can't believe it. What have I got to do to get good Wi-Fi? It's really frustrating. It's like 2006. I suddenly realized I'm moaning about my home Wi-Fi to Formula One driver Sergio Perez the day before a race. And he's going, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. And I was like, it's, I need to change tack here quite quickly. It's yes. almost as if he's a real person. Oh, my God. God. No. You're listening to Radio East Anglia, and now it's time for some traffic and travel with Martin Brundle. Martin? Thanks, Chris. Looking at the traffic cameras, the A11's completely clear, so do steer clear of that. The A47 also totally uncongested, so that's a bit of a nightmare if you're trying to get to Norwich. And traffic looks to be extremely light on the A146, so please do avoid that one if you can. Finally, awful news for anyone catching the Great Eastern train service, with news that all services are running on time. I'll be back with more travel news later. Thanks, Martin. OK, the show is packed today. Yeah, there's no one on it. Shut up, Martin. Gareth Jones on speed.
In between Richard dropping clangers of famous people he's had a conversation with about trivial things, we might just talk about the motor racing that went on over the weekend as well. It was a top race, fair play to Lewis Hamilton, who fought his way back from 312th on the grid. He's managed to travel back in time from, you know, Wednesday odd in the future, and he's done a Superman. He's actually reversed (laughs) the Earth, and he went from minus a millionth to third. Yeah. Which which is is spectacular. It's the best ever finish by someone starting so low at... Spa, I think, isn't it? There's some fantastic record he set in doing that. Something didn't like that. Weber do something similar at Silverstone a few years ago? Ooh, quite possibly. Um, Weber did. Yeah, uh, and Hamilton himself has done it in China. Mm-hmm. But at Spa, it's a record for Spa. But it was helped by virtual safety cars bunching them all up, which made it a bit easier. But in that first sort of like five laps, I think Lewis gained 207 places on the grid. Fair play to him. How does it work out? Do you understand how this works, either of you? He's got a surfeit of engines now. Because he took all his penalties in the same place, he's now got more engines than he needs it the was, end of the season. Because all the penalties were for replacing bits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're allowed to replace like three out of five or four out of five. Mm-hmm. And he's already replaced too many of them mm-hmm. and had too many actual engines and things like that. So with each different bit, he was just given more and more grid penalties until it just became meaningless. They went, well, you're going to start from the back. We may as well just build you another engine. There you go, off you go, have some fun and see what happens. My rather clever son, and he is clever because he's just had his GCSE results and they were terrifyingly good, he had a clever idea. He said, Dad, Dad, these penalties that they give drivers, you know, for starting at the back of the grid, when they run out of spaces to go back, why don't they apply the penalties on their finishing position? Hoo-hoo-hoo! You've got to argue there's a logic to that. Ooh, I'm afraid I don't like that because I think it sort of sucks the joy out of it. If you imagine if it had been applied to Hamilton mm. this weekend, mm. the achievement of scything through the pack mm. and getting from last... Well, not actually last, because Alonso, Alonso was behind, was behind, him, behind but, him, yeah, yeah. Of course he was. McLaren has to be <laughs> somehow even worse than the worst. But getting up to third, and then they'd gone, well, well done, but I'm afraid off the podium because, in fact, you came in 13th because mm-hmm. you got another penalty. I'd, I'd have found that rather dispiriting. I mean, he would have found it dispiriting, obviously, mm. Hamilton. But I think as a viewer, you'd go, oh, come on, give it's the like, boy his on. due. He, he He's w- just done something amazing. Yeah. He went from the very back yeah. and ended up in third. And you're going to take that away because... Yeah, and it's sort of, where's the incentive? Because in this era of saving engines, saving tyres, but for a natural racer like Hamilton, who you wouldn't have bet against him being on the podium, mm. even starting from last, because he is so good at carving through the pack and his natural fightiness. Mm. But if the team had just gone, look, you're always going to get them bumped out of the points again because of the penalty system. Well, just why risk the car, risk everything? Just just bumble around. I mean, I know that so he himself would be incapable of doing that, but it seems like, particularly for other drivers who are less racy and a bit less sort of determined... They would just go. Forget it. What's the it. Point? Yeah. I'll just. Well, like, I'll, yeah. I'll put in. A, I'll put in a banker. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'll put in a banker. Jensen, it's just, just been a pleasure to take part. Yeah, it's Jensen it's went out at lap four or something yeah. like that. He, that must be a huge relief for him. Ron Dennis. I was coming back to another thing that you may not have noticed. Ron was interviewed on TV. You may have seen it if you were there. Ron sounded defeated. Really? To me. Yeah, Ron Dennis. You know, we always do Ron Dennis as this kind of everything has to be very precise and OCD. Lower. The tone of his voice was different. He was kind of, yeah, well, we've done. The wind had gone out of Really? Him. Is that because both of his cars are rubbish? And will probably be like that as long as Honda are the supplier. There oh, was yeah. some talk. For reasons of, out of his control, really. Yeah. Because it's just the engine is the big issue, yeah. I guess. There was talk of Ron casting around for an other engine supplier, a major manufacturer. I won't go any more than that. Because he's desperate. Desperate. You would think that the Honda thing would work out. It just isn't doing. Their best chance, maybe the rule changes next year. But on the last two years, Honda have had to get this engine right. They still haven't done it, I feel. Someone at Mercedes said to me something interesting that historically, if you look at every time in F1, there's a fairly substantial rule change. The team that is dominant previous seasons Mm -hmm. falls away. Falls away. Yeah, yeah. So they internally apparently have this kind of right, super determination. We have to buck the trend because history tells us we're about to 
take a tumble yeah. and that the people within F1 are kind of like, oh, this could be Red Bull's moment now. Well, apparently Again. Adrian Newey is interested in designing the 2000, or is involved in designing the 2017 car. He's overseen the cars that Red Bull make for the last few years, but he will be hands-on for this rule change car that they'll produce next year. The cars will be faster, the cars may be more dramatic. Will it produce more overtaking? No, I'm pretty certain it will do the opposite. When I'd stopped wittering on about broadband with Sergio Perez, <laughs> the group of us were then talking, and Perez was confirming all this, and he said that as it stands, the wider tyres and the aero change and stuff, these cars will deliver more G than there's ever been in Formula 1. Oh boy. They're set for a significant jump in G that will actually be quite... So there's Extra gonna, physical demand. There's going to be a lot of hurting X. Exactly. Yeah. Who was it? One of the test drivers recently drove a simulation of the 2017 car and came out of a session. And his first comment was, "Boys, get down the gym. You're going to need bigger arms for next year. Mm. It's a hefty old thing to shove around. Yeah. Interesting. Not necessarily <laughs> quicker, is it? Really? Uh, the lighter, more nimbler car, more will, deft. Will more it be interesting? It will be more interesting. Uh, it, well, good. only because it's change, and you know, even if it's worse change, then it's going to be interesting. Violet and I always say, if we go and see a film and it's rubbish, it's much better than a perfectly average film. Because at least you've got something to talk about for two hours afterwards. It was rubbish because of this, 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 and this. You care. To a point, however, on a recent flight, I watched the Sasha Baron Cohen film Grimsby. How bad was it? Oh, my God. I heard it was pretty oh my, toilet. It actually made me angry that <laughs> I had wasted my time watching it. Because the one thing I, f- I struggle to do is give up on a film. Mm-hmm. We were once in the cinema. I can't even remember what the film was, but it was so bad that my wife went, come on, let's just go. And I'm like, no, I'm not going. I have to see this through to its bitter conclusion. I paid a million pounds to sit in this, <laughs> yeah, this sticky the, chair. Well, the, when you're on a plane and you've got loads of films on the entertainment system, you know, just stop it, start another one. But no, I couldn't do that. I was like, I have to see this through in case it suddenly gets better, which it did not. I watched it with a pair of teenagers who absolutely cried and laughed really? the whole way through. Really? And it's great for teenagers. And if you're with a bunch of teenagers and it's targeted at them and they're enjoying it, it's a good film. It's just probably not a film for us. Have either of you tried to watch Batman v Superman? Yes! Oh, no. It's a struggle. I don't mind it the because whole, the it explores something that the comic histories of Batman and Superman have explored over the years. It's nice to see it on screen. It didn't do it terribly well, but at least it had a good go. So I enjoyed the it. The fight was in the last six minutes yeah. and thoroughly underwhelming, and then there was the heart wrenching reason why it had to. It was just arse. Bit like Formula One, it fights in the last six minutes and it's heart wrenching. Is that what you're saying here? Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's 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 exactly it. Yes. But but Max Verstappen is here to entertain us, and Stoffel Van Dorn will be replacing Jensen Button. Okay, Are you betting man, Alex. Yep. What do you reckon? Button in or out next year? Gone? His time must be near. He must be getting bored with it by now. I'm just certainly bored with it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he can jump onto Sky F1 or Channel 4 yeah. F1 yeah. or whoever has it yeah. at any given point and just be Mr Charisma. Yeah. He has an air of cheery resignation about his role at McLaren. He's, oh, I've got to get back. We were saying this, actually. The irony of going to a Formula 1 race and then finding you actually watch most of the action on a telly mm. because wherever you're standing, you're just going... You don't get the full picture, so you are watching it on the TV. And when they stopped the race... Everyone went in the pits, all the drivers got out. The camera cut to Alonso standing there, and he had this look on his face, and we all went, look at him. He's going, oh, this is a relief. I don't have to drive that crappy car for a bit. (laughs) I'm not surprised. I think Jensen has behaved exemplarily. He's done very well, considering he knows he's in a pub. He knows it's bad. Mm. So he's just like, you know what? I'm going to do my time and then I'm going to retire to an island Mm. or something or to Murdoch Island and live on Sky F1 and it's going to be delightful. And he'll do very well at that. As he drives one of his many, (laughs) many supercars back to his yacht, he thinks... Where did it all go wrong for me? Oh, my Formula One career did nothing for me. Yeah. Oh, hello, beautiful women. Yeah. Uh, How are you just, all? Just casually brushing a supermodel off his genitals before tucking into a roast swan and going, <laughs> another crappy day at the office. Oh, this is this. I, I hate my life right yeah. now. I miss the cut and thrust of being at the back of the pack. <laughs> You've been listening no, to... No, I've got to do my clang. Oh, go on, the clang, go on, yeah. I'll end on a clang. Go on. I'll point at you again when it's coming, okay. quite soon. Okay. I was granted an audience with Toto Wolf. Clang! Ta-da! <laughs>
<laughs> who, I've always thought Toto Wolff seems all right. I was thought, I bet he is really good fun to go for a pint with. And I was talking to somebody at the Mercedes team who just went, yeah, he's brilliant. He's really good. And he's a good boss and he's good fun. And then I said later when we were on our rooftop thing on the Saturday evening, and I went, is Toto around? Thinking, I'd love to meet him, you know. And they went, he's not. But he really wants to meet you. And I went, what? That that can mean one of two things. Exactly. Either to shake you by the hand and say, mate, good work, or to be like, shake you by, shake the, you throat. by the throat. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you are on the list. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, well, I said this very thing back to the person who said it to me, and it was sort of intimated that if Toto wanted to destroy you, it would have happened by now, and very discreetly, <laughs> possibly in your sleep. Um, he'd have probably got Nicky Lauder to do it, just come in, you'd hear this crashing downstairs in your house, and then, <laughs> what the f- bugger? And then he'd come up the stairs and shoot you. I'm projecting, I don't think Nicky Lauder's a hitman, but anyway, so. It'd be a good one. The next day, I was told to come down to the Mercedes motorhome thing again, and I hung around for ages, because of course he's in meetings, it's race day, he's busy. Mm-hmm. So I hung around, I went away for a bit, and then I came back and I was just hanging around there a bit sort of like a stalky fan mm. and then finally someone came out and went um, Toto's free now do you want to come up and we, I went up to his little office upstairs oh. in the and there he was a very tall man as we know and charming and he shook my hand and he went I love your stuff it is so humoristical <laughs> humoristical which is wonderful I just thought did he actually say I those promise words? you and he said How it again beautiful. later he was talking about something else and he went oh it was an incredibly humoristical moment he was talking about something that happened and so his weird. English is impeccable the one word that he can't quite nail is humorous but I actually think humoristical is better and I'm going to start using it but he was he was absolutely Charming and lovely and funny, and I think I've got a little bit of a man crush on him now because oh, he's hello. just a top, top bloke. I don't blame you for that man crush because at Goodwood this year, I drove up the hill in a lovely Jaguar and it was very delightful. But a couple of cars behind me was Team Wolf, and they just seemed like the happiest, loveliest people. They drove past me as we were going for the start line and they were just having a ball. Oh. Mm. And they just, they seemed like nice people. So. Well, my wife's worked with Susie and has got a bit of a girl crush on Susie. She's oh. like, she's so inspiring because she's actually, you know, she's a brilliant, sort of strong intelligent woman who's sort of fighting in a man's world to be respected and stuff and yeah my wife's a bit like oh, I love Susie and I'm like oh, I love Toto would you just invite them around for dinner no we can't, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> we can't. We can't it could end up very yes. sordidly you have been oh, listening to Richard Porter <laughs> bye <laughs> Alex Coy <Kai>. bye <laughs> and I was Gareth and we'll be in the next on Speed see ya to send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones on